mirror. I, I've never, I've been depressed when I've looked in the mirror. I've never been bored looking <laughs> in the mirror. <laughs> and happily, neither have we. For the last 26 years, Hoffman has intrigued us with his wonderfully complex characters. Ratso and Midnight Cowboy. Hey! I'm walking here! I'm walking here! Ted Kramer. Daddy, it's burning! It's burning! What? It's burning! Oh, oh, oh. Marathon Man. Tootsie. Mr. Carl, I'm an actress. I'm a character actress. I can play this part any way you want. Honey, I'm sure that you're a very, you very good actress. What you're looking it's just for? that you're a little bit too soft Pardon? and genteel. Rain Man. We're going to be here the entire morning with no with no maple syrup right. and, and and no and no toothpicks. I'm definitely definitely not right. going to not going to have my, my, my pancakes with, with right. uh, uh, Ow! And now in Hero, his newest film, he plays a small time con man. But I was wondering if the money that I loaned you last week. <laughs> Some of it. I'll get you the. Uh... Rest as soon as I can. If you're a little short, I mean, it's okay. Yeah. I just don't want to take your last right. time. Well, so. I'd better keep some of it if I'm going to see the kid for gas and stuff. But in 1967, his breakthrough role in The Graduate and his seduction by the older Mrs. Robinson. Can I ask you a personal question? Ask me anything you want. Is this your first time? Is this what? It is, isn't it? It is your first time. That's a laugh, Mrs. Robinson. That's really a laugh. <laughs> For this role, as he would for later parts, Hoffman looked at his own life. There was an extraordinary difference between the sixth and seventh grade. What happened? Breasts. <laughs> I just became in awe of, 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 of this other species. That was when you discovered them, huh? They were, they looked different, and we all looked the same. <laughs> and I, and that's never changed. You mean a woman? You mean a good-looking woman who's built? It doesn't have to be good-looking. <laughs> How old were you when you had your first sexual experience? With a human being? Yes. <laughs> uh, I was 15 and a half. Well, who was this girl? She was uh, what was known in those days as a nymphomaniac. I mean, that was the term. I had... Uh, you want to hear this story? Yes, I do. How many important first times in life do you have? No, it's one of the greatest it's one subjects of the great in ones. the world. Yeah. Um, my brother happened to be home from Korea on leave. And he threw a New Year's Eve party, and the parents were gone. Risky business. That's right. So anyways, my grandmother, who had lived with us, had died, and her bedroom was not in use, but there's like a small line of uh, guys standing outside. My dead grandmother's door. And uh, I say, what's going on? And uh, they said, well, there's this older woman in there who's about 19, and she's taking guys on one at a time. It sounds terrible now. And they put me in, in front. And I was very excited. And I walked in. Her name was Barbara. She was a very nice person. Hello, Barbara. And it was very dark. And, and she said, is that you, Ronnie? Which was my brother. This was the first acting job I ever had. Because I, in a split second, my brain told me, if she doesn't think I'm Ronnie, I'm, she's going to kick me out. So I s used his voice. Yeah. And uh, um, I don't know how graphic you want this. No, of course. So anyways, I couldn't believe I was going to have a chance, uh, like so many of my colleagues in the world for their first time. It was over before it began. But I couldn't believe that was it, because I was told for years that this was the greatest thing in the world. So I just kept going. A part of me was in fear because she thought she was making love to my brother. And a shaft of light came in, and she just saw my face, and she screamed. And I jumped off and just ran out. And there were these guys. You know, they look up and they see me naked. And they just suddenly burst out into applause. <laughs> yeah, they just knew it was my first time, and they just started clapping. And uh, if I ever had to look back at the first moment I knew I was an actor, or why I became an actor, <laughs> or why it's a good idea to be an actor, that was the moment. 
As an actor, Hoffman is known to dread interviews. But we spent three hours with him. He was charming, disarmingly open, exactly opposite his reputation for being difficult, the kind of perfectionist he spoofed in Tootsie. You argue with everybody. You've got one of the worst reputations in this town, Michael. Nobody will hire you. Are you saying that nobody in New York will work with me? Oh, no, that's too limited. Nobody in Hollywood wants to work with you either. I can't even send you up for a commercial. You play the tomato for 30 seconds. They want a half a day over schedule because you wouldn't sit down. Yes, it wasn't logical. You were a tomato! A tomato doesn't have logic. A tomato can't move. That's what I said. So if you can't move, how's he going to sit down, George? I was a stand-up tomato. tomato. You're notorious, of course, for giving directors kind of a hard time. Well, I'm only notorious in, the, in terms of the media. Really? Well, sure. But the interesting question is, why is it that we get stuck with labels and you and you have it for life you, you so what, so why did you get stuck with the label of being different because it's a crazy art form it's not like some guy painting a, a painting getting up and kind of walking around and looking at it and taking a stab at it and walking away and sitting in a chair and going back and doing a little more you're trying to do art I hate to even use the word in this yeah business, you know, big letters, business, small letters, art. So this perfectionist thing is just horse <laughs> It's horse pucky. Hoffman says he got his tenacity from his mom and dad. He grew up in Los Angeles where his father, Harry, was a construction worker on the Hollywood freeway. Harry Hoffman then worked as a prop man on Hollywood movie sets and dreamed of directing. But he was fired and became a furniture salesman. His father's bitterness inspired one of Hoffman's most personal roles, Willie Loman in Death of the Salesman. I'm talking about your father. There were promises made. The first play I read was called Death of the Salesman. I would read it in secret because the man reminded me of my father. Well, he just died about a year ago. You know, I'll probably talk a little differently Willie Loman was a guy who lived in this great country called America and was told, if you work your butt off, you'll have it all. And what he didn't know is, no, the people that make it in this country are the ruthless people. <laughs> <laughs> My father, he was a very hard worker, like Willie Loman. Why was he fired? I'm not sure. Was that a painful thing for him, do you think? Killed him. Really? He was uh, abrasive, and he was always telling people, what to do? What to do. Do you think he was just afraid he'd fail? No, I just, my father coming home, can't make it. He can't cut it. He, it's like Willie. He can't make it. He comes home every day. He couldn't do it. He used to come home in a fury every day. You know, broke his ass five foot two. He was like Edward G. Robinson. He was like Jimmy Cagney. And he was like, you know, he just couldn't get anywhere. He just couldn't do it. I never knew it then. I knew it later. I knew it later. Nobody tried harder than than Harry Willie Loman Hoffman. What was his relationship like with your mother? I thought my mother was really, uh, I remember as a teenager, I felt that she allowed herself to be held down by him. You know, and she had been a, uh, uh, she wanted to be a Ziegfeld girl. She wanted some attention, didn't she? Yeah, and she wanted what she never had, I guess. She should have been in show business. And I later learned there was a, skeleton art in our closet. That's why I would never say this if they were alive. But uh, I mean, I was in my 40s and I found out that my mother was married before she married my father to a jazz drummer. She was? <laughs> no one ever talked about it. You, you must have gotten along very well with your mother. I mean, she, you must have liked her. Did you like her? I liked her, but she bothered me. She flirted with my brother's friends. And I, I remember thinking, why couldn't I just have this great big fat Jewish mother who just stayed in the kitchen. She had this great figure and she competed with us. And when I started college, she decided to go to college the same time as me. I used to see her on campus with a tight skirt and a sweater and she, I could see her kind of coming on. That probably was sexually confusing for you, wasn't it? It unnerved me. I don't know in what way. She might have turned me on a little bit. I'm sure that confused me a little bit. But I liked her more and more as I got older and that was, and, and it, and, and toward the last years of her life, we had our, some of our best talks. I really profoundly uh, missed the fact that I missed the boat with her for so many years. 
Why do you think you missed the boat? No, because I just, because I felt she was the key to that family. Because my, you know, she was the one that she, I kept begging her to get out, divorce, you know, mm. and let's have a nice house. It was a house filled with tension always. Hoffman has been married twice. He and his first wife had two children and divorced after 11 years. In 1980, he married Lisa Godshagen, who was 17 years younger. While he was working in New York, she was growing up next door to his parents in California. They have four children. You have a, a, a wonderful marriage, don't you? I love it. Yeah, I really like it. Why? It's, it's good. It's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> I got lucky. I get married. Marriage doesn't work out. I come back to L.A. My marriage is, first marriage is fading. Lisa's now 21. And her father said she just got out of college. She's going to start law school. Why don't you give her a job? So I gave her a job. And we started hanging out. I kept telling her all the time, i got to make my marriage work. <laughs> you know, yeah, she was trying to help me. When did it dawn on you you were in love with this woman? I started talking to her about some kind of pain I was in. And, and she looked at me. And, uh, and uh, I said, I, and, she, and we just looked at each other. I said, I feel like your family. I said, you're like family. You know, you have that mysterious feeling. And I just burst out crying. And uh, I don't mind crying in front of you if we were just talking. But I always resent it when I see it on those shows. So forgive me. But, but it, is the, it is one does cry when mysteries happen in life. And, uh, and so I'm not crying. For, for everyone to see how sensitive I am, it's just it's it's loaded territory, because once in a while, if if there is a God, you know, he you get lucky with God, you get blessed, and. Uh, what what did it mean to feel like family to her? I was I uh, she knew me, she knew me, and that's what it means. Somebody, and that's, I'm sure that's what it is. Some, they know you, because. Uh, You know, we're all living and dying, and we lie next to each other naked in bed for a short period of time. Strangers, people that are strangers until they meet. And then for a short period of time, we cling to each other naked, and then it's gone. Would you have a better idea of who you are at 55 than you did at 20? I don't know. Well, you know that thing you see, uh, in the stores where they say those trite sayings, life is not a dress rehearsal, right. is one of them. <laughs> right. it, I woke up one morning saying, no, it is. <laughs> <laughs> That's the problem. And what you always find out in the dress rehearsal is how much you don't know. As we said, Dustin Hoffman's new movie is called Hero, and it opens around the country next Friday. Morning. Morning. 